right, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. I'm going to be giving this one mainly sitting down, but you know me, I uh, okay. sometimes stand up. You don't need to see me, you see okay. the thing up there, you're Minson's. Um, we are streaming this, so if you have an objection to being on camera, um, leave, I guess. But, <laughs> leave, just get out. Uh, yeah. uh, it's not for commercialization or anything, it's just for uh, posterity or anything else. Um, and also, as long as we're waiting for the last few people to stream in by Pareto distribution, um, see, no economists in the audience, the joke went over, yeah. just flopped. Um, oh, okay, now you, that's right, economists don't laugh, they just say, oh, I got that. Um, uh, I'd like to plug my other activity, which is uh, organizing the debate room, which we've had a lot of fun with and be, been pleasantly surprised with how into it everybody is when they get there. It's not a free-for-all debate, it's more of a spirited discussion, and everybody's loved it, so I invite you to uh, go there. Uh, at the uh, help desk is a sheet, which on one side says, navigating the AG. If you don't have that sheet yet, you should, because uh, otherwise you'll get lost real quick. And on the other side is a list of all the debates in order, and you just pick the ones you want. So that's my plug. It's inaccurate. Uh, I want to tell you, I, I'm sure I got some of it wrong. You're right. Um, anyway, um, and the other thing is, um, uh, versus my previous uh, talk, this one is a little more structured. So I would ask that as we're going along, if you have a question that's a clarification, like, okay, what's your x-axis? What are the dimensions there? Or, or what does that mean? Or you went too fast or something like that. Go ahead and say that, or you know, let me know. Uh, but if the questions are more of a contribution nature, just hold them till the end because I've set aside lots of time for that. I'm as interested in what you have to say as you are theoretically in what I have to say. So we'll work it like that. Amen. And thank you for being here. Love it. Let's see if this works from there. There we go. It does work from here. Okay. Um, when I was uh, six years old. Uh, obviously, I was a Cub Scout. Uh, but one of my earliest memories was uh, coming to dinner, um, <clears throat> and my father, uh, at this age, and my father apologizing to the house guest that we had over for dinner that night uh, because he was afraid I would be he would be offended because I insisted on wearing these <laughs> to dinner and everywhere. So. Uh, I, my first campaign right there. Now, 15 years later, uh, I found myself as a full-time political consultant um, for Luzerna Cooper Associates. I did the computer stuff, he did the schmoozing stuff. We worked in six states uh, for all three political parties, uh, Democrats and Republicans, obviously, and that was the year that Anderson was running. So uh, that was our third party that we worked for. Um, let me just see here. Now, so you get your money's worth, since I was a political consultant, and I'm really not going to be talking about political consulting for most of this talk, but I want you to have another career. So I want you to walk away from this thing knowing what it's like to be a political consultant so you can run your next campaign, okay? For this, I need to stand up. So what, we, what we'll do is this will be the community of Metzaville. All right, you are all citizens of Metzaville. And um, as the political consultant, sorry, you'll have to move around for this one, okay. As the political consultant, I'm trying to elect the mayor. And I have all of your names and addresses in your voting history. And I would go down to the, um, there I had to, go down, because this is 1979, and there was no computers that kept track of the voting stuff. It was all handwritten. And I would send people into the uh, election headquarters, and they would copy all of that stuff onto op scans, the same thing you use to take your SAT. And then I would put it into the computer. That computer. <laughs> Dumber than your cell phone right now. That is the exact computer I used as an IBM 360. Back with the same model. Okay, And so I would figure out what do I know about all the voters? For this, I almost need two hands. And what I would do is I would separate them into 
four different categories. So could the people on the first three seats from the edge raise your hands? You're four. From the edge. From the far edge. Okay. All right. Can you be can you be my volunteer? Could you stand up and hold that so everybody can see it? Those people in the first three seats are those people in the first three seats are the supporters of my opponent. As soon as I've identified them, I do not care about you for the rest of the election. First three first three seats from the wall, raise your hands. Okay. Would you would you like to volunteer? Stand up. All of you are my supporters. I like you a lot, but I will ignore you until I need some more money. <laughs> yeah. Now, wait a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, I start the campaign by talking to the next three. So, the three uh, seats from the aisle in, raise your hands. Can you hold that up for everybody? You are my fair weather supporters. You keep letting your registration lapse. You don't vote if it's raining. You are a pain in the neck, but you're my best friends for the beginning of the campaign because I start to by registering all of you. Now, at the same time, I'm interested in the next two rows here. Uh, I did it wrong. I counted wrong. No, that's right. Two rows. So could you hold that up for everybody? Okay. The two rows from the aisle here, you are my undecideds. You are the entire election to me. You, will, you are what will make or break it. So what I do to run the election, ignore those guys, get these guys registered, get money from these guys, spend it putting TV ads to convince these guys to vote, to vote for my candidate, and come back to here on election day because they've stayed home because it's drizzling and I need to drive them to the polls. So that's my GOTV effort. And all of that together will theoretically elect the mayor of Mensaville. Yeah. So now you know how to believe, be a political consultant. Oh. <laughs> Now that was 1979, and since then uh, there's been one big change, and it was called uh, the Citizens United ruling from the Supreme Court, and so that means in Mensaville here, uh, there's more going on than just my campaign and my opponent's campaign. Any group can register themselves as a super PAC. And as long as they don't talk to the official campaigns, they can do anything they want. Can you hold your comment just to the end? You're wrong. I'm wrong. Okay. Well, I'll look for your clarification at the end. So, good. Cowboy hat, I need to call on you. But, anyway, those super PACs are what's responsible for a lot of the negative advertising that you see on television. And it's kind of uh, a wild card because it's out of the control of the official parties. So that's the, that's the reality today. But where's my thing here? But what's happened is the way I described it is still most of how the election works. And so uh, it worked for uh, this guy because he started out in Chicago uh, doing grassroots organizing. Organizing, excuse me. And uh, there's no water. Hang on. So it worked out uh, fairly well for him. <laughs> now, um, that's the that's the nitty gritty of, of uh, political campaigning. But what I want to talk about today is more why is there seem to be a growing divide.
between different political philosophies. And why is there not more cooperation about that? So that's the, the kind of reading and, and stuff I've been doing to look at that. And what started me was my 87-year-old father. Uh, he looks at uh, a person like this and says, uh, why is she dressed like that? And uh, how is she going to get a job with a, with a major in uh, feminist literature? Uh, and so on. So he has these preconceived ideas about that person and her philosophy, and he, that's as far as it goes. He's not interested in learning any, any more about it. I had the same problem with this person. Not a problem. Puzzlement. Puzzlement. Because I'm thinking this is a person of Social Security age that may be very well dependent on Medicare, and she's campaigning for less government entitlements and no socialized medicine. So to me, there's a, there's a uh, I don't understand. So my father and I are not seeing eye to eye, and the question is why are we not seeing eye to eye? So what you've got is when you, when you dig a little deeper, you've got a mental process that's different for different philosophies. And the question is, okay, is that learned? Is that innate? And so on. And so fortune, and, and it's reflected in the um, uh, politi political parties, of course, but in how we think about the political parties and what priorities those political parties have. Uh, that's mainly, mainly too small to read, but it's a great poster if you get a chance to get it. It's at informationisbeautiful.net. Um, and it's really cool in, in comparing and contrasting the uh, different attitudes of the two parties. Um, so, th this is where we are now. And so, thinking, can we make progress from this point? And uh, the answer is that the political philosophies are rooted in our morality. Now, when I talk about our morality here, I'm not talking about what morality should be. This guy is talking about what morality should be. This is a very good book, by the way, Sam Harris, The Moral Landscape. But he's looking at uh, the question, can morality be determined by science? And that's not what we're looking at. What we're looking at here is what morality do people hold, and how does that influence them, and how, why do they hold that morality? This is Sam Harris's viewpoint. This is his moral landscape. And you see it has various peaks on it. The peaks can be combinations of priorities. Uh, for the person. And so a person at one peak could be happy and a person at another peak could be equally happy, but they got there by different means. They had different sets of morality. So that's, that's his concept there. So what we're looking at now is why is yellow happy face happy in a different way than green happy face, basically? And to answer that, we've got another book. This is, this is by a, uh, uh, a uh, sociologist and psychologist, uh, psychology professor, Haight, uh, looking at why good people are divided by politics and religion. This is the uh, cover if you buy the book in the United States. Uh, if you go to England, I wish I had been in England to pick up a copy. Same book, that's the cover. <laughs> much, much clearer as far as what he's trying to uh, communicate there. So, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, quite a bit about the concepts behind this book. And I'm giving you the results of the research and the evidence. I'm not giving you all the evidence because we've only got 30 minutes. I have other things to do in the other 30 minutes. Um, and to get more about it, I would urge you to go ahead and read the book. It's very cool. It's by, I'm reading it, I would describe him as a former liberal. And he's not, he's looking at exactly what I'm talking about. What's the difference between the two and why is that gap there? This is his, one of his major conclusions, uh, that as we evolved, we were never designed to listen to reason. And this has been a surprise uh, as they do more MRI research. Uh, Sam Harris, the author of that previous book, he is a, a neurologist, a neuroscientist, sorry, neuroscientist, it's a big difference. Uh, so he's one of the people that studies people under MRIs as they answer moral questions 
And they realize that people make decisions based on what they already knew, based on their prejudices and their instincts and their intuition. And then, and they know that because that's the part of the brain that lights up. And then, one fifth of a second later, I think it's a fifth, the other parts of your brain that deal with reasoning and weighing things and getting the facts, they start to light up. And they work frantically to justify the decision that you just made for emotional reasons. It's not a great truth for medicines to behold based on our strength being reasoning ability. But unfortunately, that's just the way that, that it is, that we are, that we found it is. So what you find is that intuitions come first. Wow, I, I screwed up the innovation here, so just bear with me. There we go. Intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second. The reason I put truthiness up there, everybody knows who Stephen Colbert is, the Colbert Report. It's a good, good way of, of conceptualizing what they're saying here, is that, we, that humans make decisions and have uh, morality based on what feels right, what's in their heart. I hate to use that because it's not your heart, it's your head and, and so on, but what's heartfelt, what's, um, what emotionally resonates is what he's referring to with truthiness, and that's where the decisions really come from, the morality. Uh, I admire your skepticism in a couple faces. I share it in some things, and I can only say, read the book or many other books, like uh, the morality book that we first had up there, that goes through all these same experiments and stuff. Okay, what they've also found is that physical differences in the brain are actually slightly different for conservatives and progressives. I'm going to say progressives because they prefer that, and conservatives prefer conservatives. Um, and what they found uh, makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. The conservatives f score higher regarding fearfulness, being cautious about things. Um, and you can understand how that uh, has worked so well, because if the bushes rustle 10 times and you are run away from the bush every 10 times because there might be a lion there, you'll have run away for nothing nine times. But that tenth time is really good you're running away. So there's a huge survival benefit to that level of fearfulness in the wild, um, which explains why there's so many conservatives. Um, but liberals score higher regarding openness to new experience, which is exactly what it says. It's just being willing to try something new. Um, so those two areas, if you look at the dimensions of morality I'm going to get to later, it'll make a little make sense that this can be extrapolated to other things. Wow, you can tell I don't know anything about building animation. I'm going to just show the whole slide and then we'll go through it. Okay, this certainly looked good in the on paper. Uh, these are the six flavors, or he calls them foundations, or you could look at them as dimensions of moral values. Uh, and they are uh, care harm, uh, the, how important it is to you to, for things to, to take care of other people, basically. And how upset are you when harm comes to yourself or other people. Fairness cheating, how upset are you about fairness? Um, liberty, more in the sense of proportional, uh, I'm sorry, fairness also has a dimension of proportional, uh, uh, you know, the fairness can include the concept of people should earn what they work for, that sort of thing. That's, that's fairness in many people's eyes. Liberty, self-explanatory, loyalty, uh, very big on uh, the, what we'll talk about later is hive mentality, the thing, doing things together and authority, respecting uh, uh, people above you and, and so on, respecting the, the hierarchy. Um, so is it five or six? Should be six. What did I say five? the sixth one here. Uh, sanctity degradation. Sanctity degradation. Somebody's look, reading along at home. I, I've been, I've been, good. I like okay. Hyde. I like Jonathan Hyde. Yeah, he does. He's good stuff. Sanctity degradation is uh, the sacredness 
uh, think of uh, purity of, bo of body and mind and, uh, uh, and revulsion from things that are unclean. Uh, that's why you take your shoes off going in a house uh, in India and, and so on. It's, uh, there are cultures that, that prize this very highly. So we looked at these six different dimensions and uh, said, uh, okay, how do uh, conservatives uh, weigh these? Is, are some more important than the other? And how do progressives weigh them? And that's the way. Progressives are very, to them, care and harm is very important, and the fairness of cheating is important in the sense of equality, not in the sense of uh, uh, you get what you work for. Um, conserv and the other things are, are part of the morality, but if they have to choose between one and the other, uh, uh, loyalty versus care, if somebody's going to get hurt by being loyal, they're going to be much more, let's not let them get hurt. Conservatives value all these things equally. And so uh, one of the consequences of this is that in politics, conservatives have a lot more buttons they can push than progressives do. Progressives have to turn everything into a care uh, issue or a fairness issue. Um, not for logical reasons. Remember, in politics, we're not, not dealing, we're not talking to the logical side of the brain. Which of these things will make your heart beat faster based on your morality and therefore get you to vote for the candidate that shares your morality? That's, that's the way to look at these things. So think of Ronald Reagan making a speech and how he could hit all of those diff six different things in the things he's trying to pursue, the programs he's trying to make. He can uh, elicit the reaction he wants on any of those dimensions. This is the, uh, uh, the chart that my father said, I can't read that, throw it out, but you're Mensons, you should be able to figure it out. Um, at the left, very liberal. At the right, very conservative. And you can see the two dimensions that we talked about there at the top with a very high rating, and the others not so much. At the other end, very conservative. Uh, care and harm drop off to uh, less than the other, uh, at this point, to this one he had five dimensions, but less than the other. And so just the conservatives, you can see it's, it's dead equal. So if you can kind of think of, think of that, let's see, do I have it again? There we go. Think of that as we're talking about different issues later on. Uh, will these things make things fair? Will they avoid uh, care and harm? And uh, what can we do to frame things in ways that they are acceptable to both parties, both philosophies? Uh, another point in the book is, as he expressed it, we're 90% chimp, 10% beat. Uh, basically, we're uh, mostly rational, organizational, but also self-interested individuals. Um, we value individualism uh, more than, uh, we do things for our own benefit, 90% of the time. 10% of the time, because of group selection, we tend to act in ways that are totally group oriented. And this is probably, probably am I not talking loud enough? Or? Uh, no, you're playing loud enough. I said a quick question. Uh, can, we, can I say it to the end, or is it very quick? It's it's very quick. It's, it's about this. Is this just America, or is this across the globe? This is human beings. Human beings, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, this part, as far as morality and stuff, we're talking human beings. But different cultures can have different views of those six moralities. Uh, it tends to be the same for uh, all, uh, all areas. Uh, an example would be the uh, example of the sixth one, sanctity degradation be a Pakistani that grew up in the U.S. As soon as he had a son, he moved to, uh, I'm sorry, the authority one. Uh, he moved him and his son to Pakistan. Somebody asked him why. He said, I never want to hear my son say fuck you. Okay, so group selections made us groupish 10% of the time. Think of the crowds at a football game or a political rally and stuff. Everybody has put their individualism on a hook and they are all part of the group. They're part of the hive for that experience. 
And the author's uh, feeling about this is that is what has made humans human. Other authors have said, well, it's bipedalism that made us human, or it's our ability to do language. Uh, but it's a, it's a concept to, that, that makes sense, uh, that this has allowed us to build civilizations. Uh, so this groupishness uh, is what ties into that loyalty morality, uh, the idea of all for one, one for all, giving to other things like that. Okay. Another concept is the idea of morality binds and blinds. So this is where we get the um, bind us together to help us build civilizations. Um, his feeling is this is what distinguishes us from the chimps, and that's why we're able to do it, because we are able to cooperate in a total devotional manner um, and build group societies, interactions, that sort of thing. And it blinds us to the interests of non-group members. So that's also what divides us. Because giving up your own, uh, giving up your own uh, philosophy, giving up your own morality, is a very tough thing to do if it means that uh, philosophically you're stepping outside of your group. It's almost if to change your mind about something, you also have to change all your friends. So you can see how that's a big, a big deal. Um, also, is that difference from modern times to previously is we normally were kind of more, homo uh, more mixed uh, in terms of uh, the people we ran into, the people we associated with. But with, as you know, all the social mechanisms and groups and clubs and stuff like that, like the one we're in now, you tend to associate pe with people that are like you. So you get even more out of touch with people who are not like you. Um, there we go. Yeah. Just to know we're in. Um, so one of the ways to make that not happen is not to convince the other person that your philosophy is correct and the other person's philosophy is wrong. That just doesn't work. The way people change their minds is not through reason, it's through exposure. A good example is the guy that used to be in charge of the cross-country bus that was in support of traditional marriage. Um, and uh, he hit every town across the U.S. with their bus and convinced, talked to as many people as they can about the importance of traditional marriage. And of course, in the process, were visited by a lot of gay couples that were saying, you know, do you really want to be doing this? Um, by the end of the trip, he had... Uh, decided that there was actually nothing wrong with gay marriage because he had been exposed to enough of those individuals that he simply realized what it was and he was able to uh, take the other position. You know, exposure, not reasoning. Now, that's the philosophical portion of this. Um, the other part I want to go through is looking at how this applies to different issues in the U.S. Uh, making things fairer, making things more likely that you'll have uh, cross-party interactions, so you'll be able to have uh, more done in Congress and so on, and uh, better candidates. So I'm looking at things that will make that happen, and I've got three favorites that I want to share with you. Okay. Okay, the first one I'm going to talk about is nonpartisan redistricting, also known as uh, ending gerrymandering. Second one is controlling corporate control, and this is something that Haight also talks about. He thinks it's the one area that progressives definitely have a, a corner on, that they see something that the conservatives refuse to see, is that there's a real danger here to our democracy. And uh, better voting. And you notice none of these are uh, laws that change uh, how people behave, they're all structural. I'm talking about how can we restructure American democracy and the Constitution in order to better do things. So looking at the first one, uh, nonpartisan redistricting, um, this is the original uh, coining of the term gerrymandering. Uh, Mr. Gerrymand was running for office and he was able to have the precinct lines drawn uh, as you see, in the, they've been in this political cartoon made into a vulture. Uh, but as you can see, they kind of wind in a weird way because that's where his supporters were. I think this is an area of Boston. I think those are the suburbs of Boston. 
Is that, am I right? Yes. His name was Elbridge Jerry, and he was a senator. And he re redrew this in the I stand corrected. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 In the interest of, of uh, not running around too much, I'm going to do it off here. But imagine again that you are the uh, community of Mensaville, and that uh, all of the people on this side are the uh, square circles, and all the people on this side are the triangles. And you're electing three congresspersons. So uh, in a perfect world or a random world, you would expect that you would have perhaps two triangle uh, congresspersons and one circle congressperson. However, if the circles are in control of the state legislature and the state legislature does, writes the redistricting lines, that's not necessarily the way it's going to work. Uh, and that is the case in many states, uh, including Florida, where I'm from. So, uh, looking at this, I'm, the, I'm a circle uh, representative in the state legislature and I'm redistricting, and the first thing I want to do is make one district that is solidly triangles, right over here. So that district will always be voting triangles. Then I do another one that is right there, and it's just barely circles, but enough to get a circle representative to Congress, and of course that's the third one. And you would think, well, that seems like hard to do because really the districts are all over the place and, and uh, the communities aren't always purely one side or the other. Um, and so it, it takes some shenanigans like you saw in the Jerry thing. Uh, and that's why you end up with a district like that. This is called the Headphones District. That elects, I think, one congressman. Not in Chicago. Is that? <laughs> yeah. Those are the suburbs of Chicago. Welcome to Chicago politics. I have many more, but that's the only one I'll show you right now. Um, and back here, going back a little bit, you'll notice here that the triangle districts that elect their thing is almost all triangles. And the circles is just barely circles. So one way to look for gerrymandered district is to, to look at what is the ch difference in party registration for each of your congressional districts. And so in Florida, where I'm from, that is the way it works. The districts on the left are the ones that are that send Democratic representatives to Congress, and you see there's lots and lots of overwhelming majority of Democrats in those districts. And on the right is the one that sends Republicans, and uh, there's just barely enough Republicans to get a Republican elected. Uh, so that's why in Florida, uh, the Democrats outnumber the Republicans by 600,000, and the uh, delegation that's sent to Congress is uh, six Democrats and nine Republicans. So, welcome to Florida politics. Uh, now, uh, I'm doing okay on time, I think. Uh, the solution to this is what Florida passed uh, last year, the Fair Districts Amendment. Uh, one of the things it does is it, um, let me do it this way. There we go. Uh, you can read that. That's what the districts are prohibited from doing when you, and they have to be contiguous, <coughs> compact, and equal population as possible, as feasible. And they have to, I like this one especially, they have to make use of existing boundaries. So no two different districts on different sides of the street and stuff like that. This is a great idea. It's actually working. I won't get into the details of what's been done to try to stand in its way or to dissuade it. Um, but not everybody wants this to happen, as you can imagine. But it's underway, and probably this will have a huge influence on the uh, next elections. Okay, now, uh, looking at corporate control, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, uh, it's a lot of issues to uh, think about. Is that readable? The guy on the left has a little button that says, I voted today, the same thing you get when you, election, when you go to the booth. And the, uh, the lobbyists on the right say, I bought the politician you voted for today. <laughs> so uh, corporations doing this very quickly uh, influence politics uh, by organizing on several different levels. 
First one is direct corporate donations to the uh, to political candidates for their election. Um, and also direct contact at the golf course or whatever between politicians and corporations. So second one is industry associations and lobbyists. Um, uh, many examples of that, and that's what uh, a huge part of the lobbyist groups in Washington is. Uh, third is astroturf groups. This is a takeoff on grassroots groups. These are groups that appear to be citizens that just came together with an issue, but actually the money to recruit all those citizens and organize them came from the, the organizations, usually corporations, that want to change the law in a particular way. And so it's the astroturf groups, the fake grassroots organizations. And finally, you have the super PACs that we talked to. And I, I was hoping for more information from the guy in cowboy hat, but I think I drove him away, so I'm sorry. Um, so, looking for instance uh, about uh, industry organizations, this is the Chamber of Commerce, uh, which is controlled by uh, uh, very few institutions, believe it or not. It's not as many as they say, and it has a history of kind of being on the wrong side of history. Didn't want us involved in World War II, uh, thought Joseph McCarthy was great, uh, lobbied against part of the Civil, War Act, Civil Rights Act, and so on. Um, so, uh, they spend uh, $132 million per year lobbying Congress. Uh, not the kind of change you and I have. Um, and the chamber gets 55% of its funding from 16 anonymous corporations. Uh, another example would be the Koch brothers who, have, uh, who are billionaires with uh, paper interests in, in uh, coal, other dirty industries that uh, fight against uh, global warming and things like that. Um, now, they influence by, obviously, as I mentioned, direct campaign contributions, the Super PAC TV, as I talked about, uh, the lobbyists, and uh, loading the judiciary is the idea of making sure that uh, judges that are appointed at lower levels uh, are, as, as for these folks, corporate-oriented, I guess would be the way to say it, as possible. Uh, and this is an organized effort uh, led by uh, Bork, who you may have remembered was uh, uh, not allowed to get on the Supreme Court. Uh, and he's been doing this for uh, 20 years at this point. So a lot of the judiciary is conservative, and uh, a lot of the judiciary, where Democratic uh, presidents did not want to appoint a conservative, uh, so the Senate has simply uh, stalled those uh, vacancies. So that's why I think it's like 9% of the U.S. Uh, judgeships, federal judgeships, are empty uh, as part of it, it related to this effort. Um, and so the result is uh, uh, pretty good if you're a corporation. The tax rate has uh, gradually diminished over time for U.S. corporations. And let's see if this does it. There you go. <laughs> okay, that's that's the most. This is the most political section of the whole thing. It'll get better from here if that part offends you, but it is important to me and it makes sense to me, regardless of what my philosophy would be politically. And this this is uh, the current uh, court uh, appearing uh, to the uh, founding fathers, saying, "Scratch we the people, make it." We, the anonymous corporate donors, untraceable foreign contributors, and assorted billionaires. So that's something, some, something that could be fixed. Uh, this is Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, is that too small for people to read? I can read it. Uh, I, again recommend, I, I again recommend a law prohibiting all corporations from contributing to the campaign expenses of any party. Let individuals contribute as they desire, but let us prohibit in effective fashion all corporations from making contributions for any political purpose, directly or indirectly. There we go. Well, that's good. I, I love that. Uh, if you've been going to the debates, or each, either you've been occupying Wall Street, because you know this is the symbol for approval, and this is the symbol for disapproval. And we had about the, about the same number of approvals and disapprovals based on this, that was pretty cool. Okay. Um, next topic. Uh, oh, the, the solution to this is would have to be a constitutional amendment because the Supreme Court has already ruled twice 
uh, they did a ruling, I think, in Michigan that reaffirmed, reaffirmed uh, the uh, ruling on uh, Montana, Montana. Montana. Thank you. See, I need you guys. Okay. Uh, so there is a movement to amend the Constitution to make clear that uh, corporations are not people and money is not speech. Okay. Uh, the last of my three um, uh, suggestions is better voting. And this is my favorite and it's probably the least likely to go anywhere, but it's very cool. Uh, to start with, I, want, I thought we would, um, uh, again, go to Mensaville, but we'll be real this time. We're, we're uh, deciding between three candidates for the 2020 AG chair position. Okay? And let's see. The first candidate will be, uh, is promoting a seven day long AG. Okay? He's Mr. Blue, based on the outline of his thing. Anybody that can figure out where I got the uh, silhouette from gets a prize. <laughs> Uh, and Mr. Green, or could be Ms. Green, it was purposely anonymous, uh, Roger, uh, is all gourmet new meals for the entire AG. And the third one, uh, <laughs> red, is nightly raves. Okay? Here's where you come in. Each of the voting methods we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about um, approval voting, instrumental voting, score voting. I'll go back to this one. If you voted, uh, the regular way, the way you've always voted all your life, um, we might, it might be true, I don't know from this group, we'll find out in a second, that uh, nightly raves are the most popular. Seven day uh, is also popular, but with the same people that like the nightly raves. They want there to be a seven day nightly raves, basically. So the vote's gonna be split between those two. And there, Mr. Gourmet Meals, who would have been third, comes in first. That's the intrinsic problem with all elections, especially in things with many con candidates like Republican primaries of this year. So the idea of voting once really hurts that. So we'll look at approval voting, instant runoff voting, and score voting. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How, uh, there, who knows what approval voting is? One person. Who knows what instant runoff voting is? Five people. And who knows what score voting is? One person, okay, two people, okay. So I'm not telling you what you already know. Uh, okay, uh, instant runoff voting, rank the candidates one, two, et cetera. So let's do it. Um, how many would, this first question would, and it, you would fill this out once in the ballot box, but I'm gonna do two rounds of voting here. Um, how many people want the seven day AG guy? Okay, how many people want the gourmet meals guy? Okay, how many people want the nightly raves guy? Okay, unfortunately, the nightly raves came in third, so don't vote for nightly raves again. Now, just seven day AG? Okay, and gourmet meals. Gourmet is, uh, okay. The green one, gourmet meals won. Uh, so, uh, instant runoff, uh, what that does is it makes sure that there's not a spoiler candidate that can take votes away from the would be winner. And it's actually the way that, there we go, uh, that voting is now proposed to be done in Canada, and I think this is from New Zealand, where it has been ha has been done. And they had, they had thought that this would lead to a rise in third parties, uh, but it hasn't. Uh, so there's still two-party systems of what evolves. Um, this is not the perfect way of voting, but it's a better way of voting than you do now. Uh, the disadvantage is, is it's hard to figure out uh, local precinct results. Um, you can read the rest of that. Your medicines go fast. Okay, good. Moving on. Uh, the one I like is is at the end. Uh, the other voting methods you can use existing voting machines. Okay, approval voting. Vote for everybody you're okay with. So you can vote for many, all three, if you want. Now, how many like seven day AG? How many like gourmet meals? How many like nightly raves? Okay, gourmet meals would have won uh, that time again. Um, and here, uh, as we can see, this is actually, approval is actually better than the way you've been voting called plurality and the instant runoff you did first. This is a chart. Uh, on the right is the random winner. 
And what they're measuring is the level of your regret. How did that guy ever get into the office? <laughs> and that's really what you're talking about when you're talking about politics. Um, Christopher Hitchens had a great phrase for it when he was uh, asked, uh, why the heck did you support the war in Iraq? And he said, we must choose our regrets. Any decision is going to result in regret. You choose the one that's going to be the least regret. So you're looking for the candidate, really, who is the uh, least regrettable decision for the population as a whole. And uh, plurality, the way we do it now, is pretty close to just doing a random candidate. Um, halfway there. Instant runoff is better. Approval is much better. And score, which I'll talk about next, is even better. Um, the beauty of these things is that uh, it gets better candidates, uh, and it, it is more. Uh, it helps with the perception of fairness and the quality of the outcome. Score voting is exactly what you've seen every four years uh, at Olympic figure skating. Everybody votes for each candidate, and they assign them a score. The scores are averaged, and that's uh, the ranking of the candidate. And the one with the highest average is in office. Uh, this is a sample score ballot. You can see, uh, you can also register no opinion for a particular candidate. Uh, the beauty of it is, is you get a approval and acceptance rating, but it's a, it's a ranking. It's not a will accept or not. So it gives you much better results, and it also allows new ideas to percolate up. Uh, somebody like, say, Nader in 2000 has some ideas about corporations and stuff, and so if Nader was one of the candidates, at the end of the election, he would have a good feel for what, is, what is, um, his popularity is, what the popularity of his ideas are, even though he knew he wouldn't win. Uh, and the people could uh, score him without feeling they'd be throwing away their vote, not giving it to uh, probably Gore uh, the, uh, at the same time. So it, it solves the spoiler candidate problem, but it also allows third party new ideas to get into the system and get a fair hearing. And that's, that's what makes it cool for me. So let's try it. Um, instead of one through 10, uh, we'll, we'll do a score of uh, zero through two, so you get three choices. Your lowest uh, one would be this, that's a zero, a one, and a two, okay? What was zero? I'm just not going to see your hand. You may do whatever you want with your hands as long as I can't see it. Okay, seven-day AG, gourmet meals, and nightly raves. See, this time around, because they were so enthusiastic, nightly raves did better. The third-party candidate, at least we got an idea of what the real support for that idea was. Whereas the other techniques, we were just throwing them the hell out, and we said, unless you're mainstream, we don't want to hear from you. So very important. Uh, that's, so that's my voting thing. Um, and if you're a Republican, uh, I think your reaction is probably, oh, he's just coming up with some justification as to why Gore should be president instead of Bush back in 2000. Um, and so, yes, if it had been a plurality vote as well, a national vote, Gore would have been in office, but it would have been clearer using any of these methods. However, if there had been score voting from the beginning, Teddy Roosevelt would have beat Wilson in 1912, which would have hugely influenced what happened in World War I. How do you know? What's that? How do you know Roosevelt would have beat uh, based on, uh Based on surveys of um, uh, people at the time. I don't have the, the background information for this, but it is part of a study. Yes? He would have died in office, yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. And okay. who was his vice president, presidential uh, writing committee? I don't know. <laughs> now we've got more research to do. Uh, but the, the more main point is we, you would have gotten Teddy Roosevelt instead of Wilson again, and Wilson is perceived as, as uh, in some ways less effective than, he, uh, than another candidate might have been. Um, Harding might not have been nominated because, as I say, the place where to rally voting really falls down is in the nomination process. Uh, Bush might have been Clinton, which would have been real interesting. Um, and uh, score voting overall, because of its ability to handle multiple candidates, uh, 
nominates better quality candidates. So, good. Thank you. That's the first time I got applause on that line. Who would have been, no who would have been uh, nominated uh, uh, for six years ago? Uh, I, I didn't understand the question, but the answer is I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't have all the, the results lined up. I just know this, this part here. Okay, so those are my three favorites. Um, now, uh, my three fixes I've, I've proposed, and what I want to do next out of uh, fairness and interest in broadening this is share with you what other people have come up with, other organizations have come up with, faced with the same dilemma. So these are proposals, I'll go through them very quickly, of other um, ideas, structural ideas, not day-to-day uh, -day legislation, that can improve American democracy, usually, usually at the federal level. Now, I have an a a assistant hidden in the audience that has a list of these things so that when we get to the question period, which we should have good, question, good time for questions, uh, you can actually refer to that, uh, that list if you have comments about some of those proposals. I'd be very interested in your feeling about each of those. So if you'd like a copy of that, uh, raise your hand now as I go through the list and uh, he'll hand them out for you. Okay? All right. So the first group is about elections. Um, and obviously, uh, I'm going to go through very quickly when you read them yourself. Uh, this is limiting personal donations so that uh, uh, billionaires can automatically get elected to office, as we've seen happening a lot. Um, no negative campaigns against federal fellow members of Congress. This is a kind of a, uh, hard to understand one. What it is is that uh, a proposal that congressmen wouldn't be allowed to campaign against other congressmen in that other congressman's district. The idea is that it, there would be kind of a gentleman's relationship or, or uh, agreement, if nothing else, so that they wouldn't go back to Congress having fought each other all the election cycle. Congress itself would allow, would be allowed to be more congenial. Free TV advertising, I'm all in favor of that one. Uh, Congress, I, should, yeah, I should be looking for twinkle hands as we go along here. Uh, congressional term limits, um, there's very complex proposals about uh, three year house and uh, 15 years and out uh, Senate, things like that. Uh, there it is, the House term, three years. And uh, no oaths except the oath of office is trying to, to eliminate, uh, it may be unenforceable, but trying to eliminate candidates who uh, are forced to sign pledges in order to be nominated by their party. Uh, you can fill in the blanks. Um, and then uh, fines for non-voting, voting being mandatory. I think it would be cool. In Australia, it is mandatory. You have to, you have to vote. Okay, that's elections. Here we go, judiciary. Um, this is this speaks to the uh, loading the judgeship. Uh, the idea of that Congress will have 90 days from when the president appoints uh, a judge to approve or disapprove that appointment. Currently, uh, there are people that have been waiting years to get a vote on that. It just never gets out of committee, never goes to the floor. So this is pretty cool. Uh, judges should retire at 75, as opposed to 105, yeah. <laughs> when uh, a higher power retires them. Um, judicial term limits of 15 years. Including the Supreme Court. Okay. Yeah, yeah, all of these would include the Supreme Court, sure. Okay. And then the, uh, the presidency. Uh, we're, getting, we're getting scattered, but entirely, but very enthusiastic uh, support of some of these here. Uh, direct election of the president. No. Okay. No, 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 no. Um, let me speak to you just a second of the director. Um, and in the comments, I'd be interested in, especially if you're. Uh, Matt, yeah. If any of you got the wrong sheet, there were some mis mis sheets in here. Oh, if your if your thing has um, has how to do oh, twinkle okay. hands, you're holding the wrong sheet. Get the wrong it should be a graph with all these things we're just going over now. Okay. Okay. Good. No twinkle hands were distributed. Uh, with a direct election of the president, wouldn't necessarily uh, require a um, act of Congress or, or an amendment. Actually, the states can do it one at a time on their own by just saying, electoral Congress stands, but we're not going to send our people to the electoral Congress based on how the vote went in our state. 
What we're going to do is we're going to wait. Look what candidate got the majority of votes in the national election. And based on that, we're sending all of our candidates to Electoral Congress supporting that candidate. When it, more than half, and the, the, that law in each of the states has passed it so far, and there's several that have done so, would only go to an effect when more than half of the states have passed it. So at that instant, suddenly we have direct election of the president of, without affecting the uh, the uh, current system, current Congress. More than half the electoral college votes, you mean? Yes, yeah. right, when it represents more than half. And, and keep that comment and, and let me know as soon as we get to the discussion point. I'll start with you, how's that? She's giving me the evil eye, I feel. Okay, uh, regional presidential primary so that we don't get this four-year election campaign. Uh, and it also would, uh, uh, and let me go back once, one real quick thing. Also, in the direct election of the president, the advantage uh, would be that the entire campaign isn't played out in the five swing states. It's actually played out throughout America, and all of America's issues are addressed. Okay, regional presidential primaries addresses the uh, two-year presidential campaign, campaign with every state jumping in front of every other state. Uh, monthly questioning of the president by the House. Uh, some people like that, uh, I would cite precedent that George Washington tried that, was um, trolled by Congress, <laughs> and left Congress in a huff, went back to the White House and vowed that he would never go back to Congress and answer any questions there. And every president since then has followed that precedent. Um, okay, war approval from Congress rather than the president just sending off our troops, which we're obligated to support, and so on. The budget. Um, here's here's a, a cool one. Anytime, anytime there's a deficit of more than 3% of GDP, all sitting members of Congress are ineligible for re-election. Now, well, he didn't get paid is right there. Wait, there's no pay up. But more powerful is you can't even run again. Now, for the bonus points, who came up with this? Warren exactly, Buffett. Warren Buffett. This is the Warren Buffett proposal. Okay, and then the, the, the meeker one, if we just won't pay you as long as it's not undone budget. Okay, Congress, real filibuster. Uh, I'm actually doing well on time. Uh, real filibuster, what that means is explain better on the sheets that you have. Um, it used to be filibuster is like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. You stand up there and tell your horse gets horse like mine is. And then um, uh, when, you're, when you run out of energy or fall asleep, then the Congress can continue its work and, and vote on stuff. Now, all you have to do to do a filibuster is send a memo to the, uh, the head of, of the, your house, uh, or the head of the Senate, it's really a Senate issue. Um, and uh, there's declared a virtual filibuster. And nothing happens until uh, two-thirds of Congress agree that something should happen, until the, the virtual filibuster is overrun. Uh, and as a result, filibuster has been used hundreds of times versus the dozens of times it's been used in the past. Okay. Uh, majority can bypass the committee, so you uh, no longer have the problem of bills being held up in, in committee, um, which is, if, if you follow Congress, is a big deal. Um, then, uh, I, I love this, make members come to work. Currently, the, the, what actually happens, I'm never going to tell you about this, is Congress flies in from their home district on Tuesday. They work Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and fly back to their home district. They realize well, very well you know, which side their, their bread is buttered on and that all of, all of re-election is about constituent services, how many people you touch personally with your staff and so on. Um, let's go ahead. This is a Newt Gingrich introduction. This, Newt Gingrich introduced this. Introduced this. I think it's great. I would, you know, I would, I'm sure, I think, I hope I would have even supported it had it known it came from Newt Gingrich. <laughs> but the idea, the idea is that Congress should uh, work for three weeks. Go ahead. He introduced the everybody stays. Oh, he started the thing I'm trying to get rid of. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
then I'll just say it's a good idea and I won't address where, where it's coming from, what it would eliminate. Uh, but the proposal is that Congress would be in session the first three weeks of the month, then everybody goes home for a week of constituent services, and then they work a solid three weeks. So that's, that's the idea behind that one. And then uh, monthly bipartisan meetings with added agendas, that doesn't happen now. Currently, congressmen only talk to other congressmen in their own party, the majority, the whip, uh, uh, coalitions, that sort of thing. And uh, bipartisan seating in Congress, uh, which is the same thing I've been talking about all along. Exposure to the other side results in understanding the other side, which results in progress. And bipartisan leadership committee, same idea. Okay. That's my overall theme here. Keep calm and get along. Uh, oh, as soon as I get the discussion, I'm going to do one little, little blurb here at the end, and then we're going to do a discussion. We're going to do it there and there. Okay. Let's do this one here. This one, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, okay, as you can see, all these are systemic changes as opposed to, to legal ones. And the ones that I was intrigued as I, as I read more uh, are the ones that try to set up a system where greater understanding and therefore greater productivity can happen. And that's something that uh, our national Congress uh, has been losing over the past 20, 30, 40 years. So that's the idea. I'm going to turn it over to discussions now and let, uh, let you guys find out what you guys thought. And I'm going to, I'll repeat the questions, or repeat the, the comments as they come up. Uh, go ahead. Well, direct uh, election of the president, Oregon has six electoral votes, which hardly count anyway, and they always go Democratic. Uh, but we would have no say whatsoever. And besides that, Portland is one little spot in Oregon, but it runs the whole state. And it's just so different every place else. I mean, Multnomah County is totally... Yeah, uh, so Portland would have a proportional influence on the uh, race based oh, on its population. They, they wag the dog now. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the base, okay. I mean, Oregon basically elected Dudley governor, but somebody found some ballots in their trunk, and we got kicks off her. Okay. From Multnomah County. Okay, I understand. Proposals. Oh, go ahead. Three proposals. First one is ban lobbying. Yeah. Oh, ban all lobbyists. Yeah. Okay. Now, that means that probably the, the gardeners to the congressmen will be kept, will, those jobs will be taken over by lobbyists so they can get some exposure. <laughs> yeah. Now, a related a proposal, though, is that every minute of face time between a congressman and someone who's not a constituent uh, or who works for a, uh, a particular interest group has to be logged and publicized so that everybody knows who's being influenced by who. I have one more comment. Uh, okay, no, but she has three, so go ahead. Okay, uh, people who serve in Congress should not be allowed to go and work for people that whose issues they are voting on. Right. What's the, what's the name for that? I don't know. Revolving door. Revolving door. Very good. Could you repeat all of the questions? Yeah, I will. Best, please. And that uh, that uh, people who serve in political positions should get the same pensions, social security, and the same health care as everybody else. Uh, okay, so th it is, this is a well-known one. Congress should should live by the same uh, uh, social security and. Uh, Medicare and stuff as they pass laws for the American public. Currently, Congress has its own own system and stuff. Okay, I think I saw. Uh, actually, why don't I do this? I because we, I always hit people in the front. I'm going to hit in the back. So very loudly, lady in black. Yeah, standing up. My yeah. Um, I think America is one of the only countries left, or first world democracies, where you have to vote. Uh, Allowing voting on multiple days <coughs> or by mail uh, or 
bring out a completely different group and hopefully a lot more voters. Yeah, voting on Tuesday is, is kind of silly. It's been proposed, let's move it to Saturday when everybody might be available to vote, sir. Yeah. Uh, two questions. In the interest of fairness, uh, wouldn't the restrictions you're proposing in corporations also, should they be applied to unions? Oh, probably. And yep. does their spending eclipses a lot of corporate? They're spending eclipses some corporate, but, but relatively speaking, no. Second thing is, yeah. You didn't touch on voter fraud, which is very systemic in the California where I live. I understand that, that to be the conservative position, but from the reading I've done, voter fraud is really not a big deal. Uh, Governor Scott in Florida uh, spent millions of dollars throwing uh, thousands of people off the rolls just recently and found two people that were actually fraudulently registered. So it's I, I respect your saying that, but my research says that uh, the result of, of massive uh, unrooting of voter fraud is kind of like McCarthyism, where you're destroying a lot of uh, uh, leg legitimate interests. Uh, in the red red shirt in the very back, and in the red shirt in front of him. When you come up with the issue of voter fraud, I bring forth the example of Chicago, the home of our president currently. 40,000 votes were counted from people who've been dead for up to five years. Damn, they're good Democrats. I rescind my comment regarding Chicago, though. <laughs> um, but let me clarify with the, with the voter fraud thing. It's not an issue that should be thrown away without considering it. It's an issue that should be done in balance with what's going to be the effect and how many false negatives versus false positives are you going to have. So it's really something worth it. And I'll get back to you right after. Red shirt in front. Agree to eliminate earmarks. Agree to eliminate earmarks. Very good. Lady with a scarf. I've also got two questions. The first one is, how does the first part of your, speech, uh, of your presentation relate to the second one? Because in the first one, you sort of stress the differences between conservative and progressive thinking, which would imply that a problem with American democracy, or rather American politics, is a, is a polit uh, polarization. Uh, in, yeah, in Polar polarization is a big but, issue. Uh, then you, you propose um, structural changes that don't really apply to these to these different kind of thinking, and uh, which rather is a problem that of democracy, but not really politics. And the second one then is you propose a yeah like a long list of elements of political system, the things that you could change. Uh, some of those are already present in other political systems. Do you think they are simply additive, or do you see potential interactions between these individual elements, and how would you combine? Them? <laughs> I know the second one. The first one is you caught me in that I'm giving two different uh, talks. One is uh, political thinking, and the other is structural changes that will make things mainly fairer, but a lot of the things on the list will also address the getting Congress to work with Congress as opposed to separate politicians doing their own thing, as is set up now. Uh, so many of those do address that, but the idea of, uh, for instance, the voting, the analysis has been that having the, those improved types of voting uh, that recognize new ideas uh, gets a result. The winning candidate is likely to be a better qualified candidate, but also tending to be more moderate. Uh, I can't give you the details of why that works out, but it, things tend to, to move to the middle. So they do address it. They don't address it completely. And it's not a perfect talk. So there you go. Uh, let's see, I'm just moving all the way up. So the gentleman in the black t-shirt, uh, Idle America. Uh, um, term limits. If, if, you, if you start kicking people out early, they don't have a chance to learn their jobs or, or to learn how to do their job effectively. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the other side of term limits. You're right, sir. I like your constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. But in this acrimonious society we're in, how do you pass any substantive amendment to the Constitution? We couldn't even pass an innocuous equal rights amendment. Exactly. I didn't think, I didn't say they were easy. <laughs> but you're right, the, the odds of actually passing that amendment uh, soon are slim. Uh, but the amendment is a gra gravitational point to uh, coalesce interest in that 
this need, I think. Wouldn't you be better off to change the shape of the court and let the court take another shot at it? Well, that's part of the, one, one of the many proposals, like Roosevelt wanted to ex expand the court to 13, uh, and they talked about reducing it and stuff like that. I'm gonna get back to you, but these people haven't talked yet, but you're on the list there. So, uh, Ma'am. a quick response on the term limit deal. In the state of Oklahoma, about a decade and a half ago, I don't remember exactly, uh, we had term limits, and one of the sitting congressmen who would be quickly term limited out said, oh, I couldn't believe the idiots in Oklahoma had passed this. But now we have such, our our budget is has been cleaned up. We've gotten rid of a lot of the pork barrel stuff. We fixed roads. We have one bridge that's supposed to be like one of the worst in the whole United States and all this. And all these things were just being iced over. And another thing is um, my husband was on the city council, and I wish I could remember this quote that came through one of the um, OML letters. But it said something about, in our form of government, it is every citizen's responsibility to serve, and it's every politician's responsibility to get the hell out of the way so they can. Thank you. Mr. Izod. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things you talk about gerrymandering, it, it's uh, not just to get a majority of like-minded people on. It's also to get a stable person who maybe a particular party chair wants to have in there a long, long time so that no matter what, they will continue to have influence possibly corrupting. The other issue, speaking more to the lady in the sunglasses uh, question about getting political thinking, it's, a, it's really difficult because speaking with, a with a, something of a background in cognitive psychology, we are terrible at recognizing our own biases. This is why negotiations, nobody's ever happy. Look at the Middle East. Same thing when you think you're trying to be reasonable with a different party. That you think you're being reasonable, they think they're being reasonable, that you see the other side is unreasonable, and you just keep ratcheting up, and now we have Congress. Now, you know, on, on the gerrymandering thing, to, adding one thing, uh, the incumbent issue is very big, because if uh, a person is elected from a certain district, uh, there's an implicit threat that if that elected person doesn't follow their party and their party leader, next time they redraw the lines, that person's going to be out of, they're going to be redistricted out of their previous district and unable to get reelected. Ma'am. I'm a retired veteran, and uh, recently uh, uh, Representative Joe Walsh uh, berated his opponent, a uh, combat veteran who lost both of her legs, amputated because of an uh, improvised explosive device, saying that she had no right to use her combat experience. I propose that while we are in times of war or other combat, that all of our leaders spend rotations leading the troops <laughs> in the war Thank you. Yes. Okay, the gentleman, thank you for waiting. Gentleman, the blue shirt's been waiting. Personal story that affects all of us. I think our democracy is in peril with this issue of voter fraud. One brief story. The last can, you do it, can you do it like 45 seconds? Less. Okay. The last recent ele uh, national election, I went to the polls late in the day, saw my neighbor's signature in California where I live, we have to sign in. And my neighbor just had a stroke, so it was impossible, when he was in the hospital, it was impossible for him to have signed that. I happen to know that the county clerk who runs our elections. I asked her about this. She said there is a movement afoot, one of the national parties who remain anonymous, bring a bunch of people in late in the day because they can get the roles of the non-voters. And they go and they say, hi, I'm, I'm uh, Matt Cooper. What do you know? I haven't voted yet. And that, I think, disenfranchises us all. And we have found out from our research from this incident that is affecting almost every precinct in the United States. Yes. Wow. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, g gentleman in the, in the uh, red shirt in the back row had wanted to speak. Did you have a gentleman in the back row? I, I heard the gentleman with the blue. We've had the same situation in Minnesota. We've had the same situation up in Minnesota where a van load of people have showed up at a polling station down to Wyndham, Minnesota. One, under our rules, one person can verify or vouch for another person so that they can vote. That's great. The 15 gentlemen in the back of the van came in, one 
gentleman who spoke English came in to verify <laughs> all the others were good voters in that district. They couldn't even recognize the town they were in. None of them spoke English. In Minnesota, we have a move to get voter ID. We're willing to put in everybody who wants an ID will receive one free from the state if they have to. The catch is the Democratic Party is absolutely against it. Wonder why? Dude, you got, got a lot of twinkles. That answers, answers your question there. Okay, we are uh, just, uh, is it 30, 10 seconds? One more comment on voter fraud. As I understand it, the voting machines are fraud. With, not by the Democrats, and there's been a lot of fraud going on with them. So, voting, she's saying uh, voter voter machines, electronic voter machines especially, uh, have been found to be tampered with, and that that's another area for fraud to address. And so, to close, in the words of the late uh, Rodney King, can we just all get?